So in our journey to learning the Lua language, we have been using a programming paradigm that is called procedural programming. Right? And procedural programming is basically having all these little procedures, these functions that we can pass parameters. You know, when we have variables, we have all these ideas of variables, functions, data types. This is classic procedural programming. Right? This is the traditional way of using procedures, functions, and that is what we have been using so far. But you will see that programming languages and software engineering, right, lately, we use a lot of these ideas of different paradigms to program. We don't have to always tackle the problems and solve our problems using procedural programming. And you will see that one of the most popular paradigms that people have been working in the past 20, 25 years is object-oriented programming. Right, so I think it is important for us to stop for a moment. And before we start showing some Lua code that works with object-oriented programming, I will try to, in five or 10 minutes, do a quick review of what object-oriented programming really is. Because I want everyone to be on the same page and I'm going to start using some terms, some names, some jargon, right? So whenever I use this jargon, I want you to be aware of what they mean in the OOP, uh, right under the umbrella of what we call object-oriented programming. Okay, so instead of using these functions, parameters, and variables, we're going to have this kind of self-contained objects. And these objects are going to communicate with each other. So before I start, I'd like to just give an example of what I want to use so we can maybe understand what objects are giving and putting things into context. Right, so do you remember, I spoke to you and I kind of mentioned a game called Street Fighter. So Street Fighter is a very classic game that you have, you can select the player, you can select the little fighter that you want to uh, fight with, and then you go, they fight with each other, and then you can kind of punch, you can kick, you can do all this little, give a special attack move, right? So we have all this idea of a traditional fighting game. Whenever we start thinking about object-oriented programming, object-oriented programming started as this attempt of making software engineering, making software development more human friendly, right? So we, with object-oriented programming, we are gonna try to talk about software components and all these ideas of software elements as real world objects, right? So you see these instances that you have in the real world, things like a desk, a laptop, a mobile phone, a monitor, or even kind of more abstract ideas of student, teacher, bank account, customer, order, items, product, we are going to start to think about these elements not as variables, not as string, integer, numbers, text. We think about them as self-contained objects, right? So I have a student object, I have a desk object, I have a bank account object. And whenever we talk about these ideas of objects, we have to remember, right? So if you go back to our example of our street fighter, do you agree that we have the little fighters in the game? Each fighter can be thought of as an object, right? So whenever I say an object, you have to remember this thing. This is super important. Objects in this OOP paradigm, right? In the object-oriented programming paradigm, objects are basically a collection of data and functions. Right, so it's almost like I put together in a little object ball and I say, here is the data of this object and here are the functions that the object can call to manipulate the data. So if we stop and we look at our example of our fighter, do you agree that every little fighter that I have right in my game, every little player that I can select, this is going to be a fighter object and every little fighter object, they can have a name, Right, so I'm going to call them something. So they're going to have this name. This is the data, right? So this upper part is the data of my object. Name is an example of something that I can store. Health, I think about health almost like the health bar, right? So what is the percentage of health that that fighter has currently? So is it 100% health, 50%, 10%, or zero, right? So health is going to be a number, data. Uh, also the speed, some characters, some fighters are faster than others, right? So maybe I have a little factor of the speed there, a little number that tells me what is the speed. So this upper part right here, you will see that this is an example of the data that that fighter object can hold inside. 
In the object-oriented programming world, we usually call this data the attributes of our object. Right? So these are going to be the attributes, but also our objects in our game. We have the option of invoking and calling some functions. Right? So do you agree that every fighter, they could go and perform what we call a light punch? So in the Street Fighter game, we have two different types of punch and two different types of kicks. We had a light punch and a heavy punch, and we had a light kick and a heavy kick. So every fighter object in my game, they should be able to perform and invoke these functions of light punch, heavy punch, light kick, heavy kick, and also if they had a special attack, right? So if they have a Hadouken or if they have an electric shock or whatever the special attack is for them. If this thing here was the data, if these were the attributes, here underneath I am going to list what we call these methods. Right, so the methods are almost like functions that our object can invoke, can call. So attributes and methods, right? Keep these terms always, remember always these terms because I'm going to start ping-ponging ideas and discussing things with you by saying, oh, the object attribute, the object method, right? So just keep these things in mind, right? But this thing right here is not an object yet, right? So this is just a description. This is just a blueprint of what every fighter object in our game is going to kind of look like and be able to store and invoke. Whenever we are declaring this blueprint right here, you will see that we're going to call this thing right here a class, right? So classes are these basic descriptions of all the attributes and the methods that our objects of the type fighter are going to be able to store and invoke, okay? So a class is a blueprint, right? The same way that you can have one blueprint and create several houses based on that blueprint, uh, we are gonna be able to use one class to create several different objects of that class. So just to put things into context again, let's just say that I have this fighter, this fighter, and this fighter. They are different fighters, right? So this thing is different than this, and this different than this one right here. They are special, unique objects of the type fighter. But this thing, this thing, and this thing right here, this object, this object, and these objects, they will be all of the same class, right? So this thing right here, which is the Honda fighter, right? The Honda fighter is going to be an object of the fighter class blueprint, right? So this is an object of the class fighter. This thing right here is also an object of the class fighter. And this right here is an object of the class fighter. So whenever I am trying to declare these things as objects of a certain class, of a certain blueprint, you will see that in Lua, I can simply go and say eHonda, right, the name of my object, I'm creating an object, is equal to fighter colon new. So whenever I say fighter colon new, I am calling the constructor method to create a new fighter. And I can even pass the parameters of how I want to initialize the attributes of that object. So eHonda is equals to fighter colon new. And you will see that this colon notation is something that is very unique to the way that Lua works with objects. So fighter colon new. And then I can open parentheses and start passing a little table with the attribute values, right? So key value, key value for the attributes and values. So I can initialize my object with the name e Honda. I can say that the health starts with 100 and the Honda speed is 25, right? Let's just say that it's very slow. So this is us creating an object of the class fighter and initializing the attributes with certain values. The same way that I created an object of the class fighter called Honda, I can have a new object also of the class fighter, but then this object is gonna have different attribute values. I can initialize it with the name Blanca, the health is 100 as well, and then the speed is 60. Right, so let's just say that's a little bit faster than the Honda object. And you know, right? Same thing, I can have now Chun Li, this Chun Li object that is also of the class Fighter, and I can call Fighter colon new, passing the name Chun Li, the health 100, and the speed 85. Let's say that Chun Li is a lot faster than all the other characters. So I know that this is very high level, right? But I just wanted to understand that we're going to have all these concepts of attributes, 
meaning the data that our object can store. And we're going to see how we can declare now the methods, right? So what are the functions? What are these little calls that our object can invoke? Light punch, heavy punch, light kick, heavy kick. So these are the methods that we're going to be able to invoke. Perfect. So I'm going to show here on the screen an example of how we can declare a class and how do we define what are the attributes, what are the methods that this class fighter, for example, is going to have. So I'm going to have to declare a class fighter that has the attributes name, health, and speed, and has the methods light punch, heavy punch, light kick, heavy kick, and etc. So let's look at the Lua code that will make this possible. Right, so right here on this slide, I have a full code that is the declaration of my class, right? The declaration of my object blueprint. So the way that we start these things is, first, I can start by defining the little table with the attributes, right? So I can say, define the class attributes, and then I say fighter, and you will see that traditionally, I name my uh, classes with this uppercase, right? So fighter is going to be a class, and this class I can initialize with the attributes that, that those objects are gonna be able to hold, right? So I can initialize with name. So you'll see how I am initializing name with empty. That is just me kind of, cleaning the attributes, right? So I'm just kind of initializing them with some empty values. So fighter class is going to have name, is going to have health, which is going to be a number, as you can see by me initializing there with zero, and also speed, right? So speed is also going to be a number because I just initialized that with zero. So that is me initializing the attributes of my class. And now I can come here and I can start adding what are going to be my class methods, right? So what are going to be the little functions that I can invoke as my object methods? So as you can see here, I can say function fighter colon light punch. Remember when I said that the colon was very unique of the way that Lua worked with these ideas of methods. So class colon the method name fighter colon light punch. For now, all I'm doing is I'm not actually implementing anything is I'm just printing something on the screen whenever we invoke that method, right? So print fighter self.name performs a light punch. Self.name, we are going to understand this a little bit better later, but whenever we invoke a method, the object is the one responsible for calling the method. So whenever an object invokes a method, we have access to the actual object that was the one that called that method by using the little self keyword. So if I say self.name, I'm going to get the name attribute of the object that just called this function right here. Don't worry, we're gonna see this very soon of how these things work, right? So I declare a method and these ones right here are exactly the same thing. I'm declaring a new method, fighter colon heavy punch, which is just print something, the light kick that just prints something, the heavy kick that just prints something, and also the special attack that just prints something. So I have all these little functions that are going to be actually methods of my object. And this is how I declare then the attributes, and this is how I declare the methods of my class, right, of my blueprint. And right here, this is what Lua uses, right? So Lua uses this concept of a meta table to kind of bind these things together. Right, so I have what we call a class constructor method, right? So I can say fighter colon new, and then I pass a little t as parameter, right? I have to pass a little table as parameter. I have a very special syntax there that says t equals t or open, close, curly braces. This is a very special Lua syntax. It's like a syntax sugar thing that says t will receive the value of t if t is not nil, and if it is new, I will go to the OR and assign empty curly braces. So it's basically saying T is equal to T or curly braces. If T is new, then I assign the empty curly braces table. All right? So this is something that you will see sometimes as used in Lua, right? So T is equal to something or curly braces. Uh, so if by any chance the thing that we are trying to assign is empty, if it is new, then I assign the second option, right? I assign the curly braces. Okay, so T, the parameter is going to be not new, uh, hopefully, right? So I, then I assign T the table. I create the bind between my 
meta table and my table. So I'm going to bind the set meta table T with the self object. And then I say self underscore underscore index equals to self. This thing right here is what actually creates these ideas of binding methods and binding the attributes in this object idea of Lua, right? So I have the attributes, I have the methods, and then here is where I actually make things happen. I actually bind the methods and the functions and the attributes in this little new object that I create, okay? So this is how we create a little class declaration, right? So all these things right here is how we declare attributes, methods, and then the constructor. Right, but this is not enough, right? This is just the blueprint of our objects. We need to be able to now go and create the objects themselves. A class is just a blueprint. I need to use this class to go ahead and actually create objects of the type fighter. So here on the right, I have a couple of examples of me creating objects of the type fighter, or you will see programmers call this instantiation, right? I'm going to instantiate an object of the type fighter. So in the first part of the code, I am creating objects. So you can see that I'm creating blank, which is equal to fighter colon new. And then I pass as a parameter the attributes that I want to initialize the object blank with. So name equals blank, health 100, speed 60. As soon as I'm done calling the fighter colon new, I print object blank dot name was created. So I can have access to the little attribute by saying blank dot name. Okay, so I'm not hiding the attributes inside. This is an example of a class that has the attributes public. I can say blanca.name. This is how I access the attribute inside my Blanca object. So as soon as I'm done creating the Blanca object, I go ahead and I create a new object of the type fighter. So Chunli equals fighter colon new with the attributes of Chunli. So name Chunli, health 100, speed 85. And as soon as I'm done, object Chunli.name was created. So these two calls are me calling the constructor and creating two objects of the class fighter. And as you can see here on the bottom, I can also start calling the object methods, right? So look how my object is the one responsible for calling its own methods. Blanca is calling the light punch. Blanca is calling its heavy kick. Blanca is invoking its special attack. So this is not a normal function call. Do you see that is the object colon the method name? I am using the object to invoke its methods. And I can perform the same thing with Chun-Li. So I can ask Chun-Li to perform a light punch. I can ask Chun-Li to perform a heavy kick. And I can ask the object Chun-Li to perform its special attack. This is extremely important. The objects are responsible for calling their own methods. And this is one of the powers of object-oriented programming. As we start coding with these things, you will see that this brings a lot of power to us. So just a quick review again. On the left, I have our class definition, right? We define, we declare our class, the blueprint that is going to be used to create fighter objects. And on the right, I am actually creating the objects by calling the class colon new, passing the attributes, I create two objects, and as soon as I'm done creating the objects, then I'm free to go and start invoking and calling their methods, which are basically those functions that we declared before. And still talking about this idea of the objects being responsible for calling their own methods, I just put a couple of examples here, right? So remember how Blanca was the one responsible, the object Blanca was the one responsible for invoking and calling the light punch method, right? So the object is responsible for calling its own methods. Chun-Li was the one calling the heavy kick. Chun-Li was the one calling the special attack. Let's just say that I have in my system a bank account object. So in a bank account, do you agree that it would be beneficial for us to be able to ask to withdraw an, a, a certain amount from a bank account or even deposit an amount? So the way that I would do that is the bank account object is the one invoking the withdraw method. And I can pass parameters in the methods as well if I want. So what is the amount that you want to withdraw from the bank account? Let's say that I want to withdraw 200, right? Or bank account colon deposit. So I am invoking the method deposit from the bank account object. And I can say how much I want to deposit in that bank account. Okay, so the object is the one that invokes, that calls the method on its own, right? On its own data. 
Let's say that I have a student object in my system. I can say student and students usually will have a method called enroll, right? And I can even pass a little string value of what is the name of the course that I want to enroll, right? So I can say student enroll in the Lua course, and then I can have student enroll in the Calculus 2 in the university or something like that. So again, Objects are the ones responsible for invoking and calling their own methods, right? So that is how I have to see things right now. It is not a vanilla function that I can just say, we draw a certain amount, and then I have to, inside the function, decide the variable that I have to withdraw from. In the object-oriented world, my bank account object is the one invoking the methods, and then if I want, I can pass parameters or not, right? Uh, this is optional. So if my method asks for parameters, I have to pass. If not, I can just say heavy kick, special attack, and there is no need to actually send any parameters to these ones right here, okay? Right, so 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just, I think it was, I think it was important for us to just stop for a moment and do this quick review, because we are going to start talking about creating classes, we're going to start doing some exercises of creating methods, calling methods, and you will see, right, in the actual implementations, whenever we are going to use Lua in the wild, if you are using Lua with Roblox, if you're using Lua with Eco8, if you're using Lua with any other game engine or any other application, chances are that they will be using some object-oriented uh, power, right, within their own API and within their own application. So, is important for us to understand how this object-oriented paradigm works because then we can start talking about attributes, methods, and just evolve as programmers.